the Pikes Peak chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society and the U.S. Forest Service present Vogel Canyon, a renewed face, a renewed spirit, a program funded in part by a state historical fund grant from the Colorado Historical Society. It's the beginning of a new era at Vogel Canyon in southeastern Colorado, a time of rejuvenation and renewed respect for the land and the stories it contains. These fifth grade students from West Elementary School in La Junta are the first group to experience the results of a 10-year effort to revitalize the canyon. For hundreds, even thousands of years, Vogel Canyon was home to Native Americans. Through time, different cultures were drawn to the canyon's reliable water sources and to the wildlife and trees which also depended on that water. As each group moved on, they left behind the remnants of tools and remains of their homes. Later, explorers, traders, and homesteaders visited the canyon, drawn to the same reliable water sources on which Native Americans had depended. Traces of these later groups are revealed nearby on the Santa Fe Trail and through the partially remaining stone walls of early homesteads above the canyon. From prehistoric to historic times, canyon dwellers recorded parts of their lives on its sheltering walls. Through carvings and drawings, they left messages for future travelers and they marked significant events, people, and places. Eventually, this record of the past became an integral part of the canyon itself. Yet up until a few years ago, Vogel Canyon was in danger of being destroyed. There were reckless parties in the canyon. Remains of broken beer bottles, scattered trash, fire rings, and spray-painted names all over the canyon walls. Some vandals carved initials into the sandstone. Others, sporting rifles and shotguns, used the walls for target practice. Graffiti spread rapidly, sometimes obliterating irreplaceable ancient artwork. Vandalism was erasing the legacy of the canyon. The United States government acquired Vogel Canyon in 1937 to control soil erosion caused by the Dust Bowl. The Comanche National Grassland was created in 1960. In 1987, Forest Service archaeologist Al Kane was brought on board and began investigating the Vogel Canyon area. Soon the goal was to bring vandalism under control. The Forest Service strengthened its resolve to build partnerships to preserve the canyon. We did do a, a, a study down there in an environmental analysis, uh, and that resulted in the first positive steps we took down there, which was to uh, shut off the bottom of the canyon from, from traffic and, and build a rudimentary trail at that time. The following year marked the last occurrence of spray paint graffiti in Vogel Canyon. The Forest Service responded vigorously. They investigated, documented the damage, and successfully prosecuted it as a crime. I really think Vogel Canyon is special because not only do you have the, the prehistoric uh, American Indian presence there, you also have some part of the early homesteading uh, groups or, or families there, and, and you have the Santa Fe Trail. So not only is it, is it the rock art, but it's also a, just kind of a, a milieu of, of history starting in prehistoric times and, and working up to the present. So it really kind of mirrors a lot of the American heritage and American experience. A lot of the rock art restoration was really the uh, brainchild of, of Deb Dandridge. Deb really took a great interest in Vogel Canyon because it kind of fit in with her rock art interests. And she had some contacts from her work in uh, North Dakota with uh, with institutions like the University of North Dakota, and she was able to do a partnership uh, with the university, and specifically with Claire, Claire Dean, who later became a consultant. It was going to take a lot of work, 
financial backing and expertise to clean up this unique place. The Forest Service alone could not fund the conservation project, nor could it provide the necessary workforce. The state of Colorado had created the State Historical Fund in 1992 specifically to foster historic preservation projects for public benefit. That included archaeological sites such as Vogel Canyon, which also appears on the State Register of Historical Places in Colorado. Well, I think our interest in uh, Vogel Canyon was, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, but I think it was the vandalism aspect that uh, caught our attention more than anything else, because vandalism has been such a problem in the state uh, for a variety of different reasons in, in different contexts, but especially relating to archaeological sites. And the value of these resources and the harm that can come to them from that kind of vandalism uh, is something we really would like to correct. And, and much of that type of vandalism was really done because they didn't really know any better. I mean, you know, kids out there playing around and uh, didn't really have, have the understanding of the importance of those resources and what kind of harm can come to them by vandalizing them. Colorado's state and federal agencies joined with interested educational organizations to start an interagency anti-vandalism task force, which had as its objective to combat the epidemic of destruction of our archaeological and historic sites. We've adopted our slogan, Save the Past for the Future. This is focused on future generations. It attempts to raise the ethic of conservation so that our historic places will be available to our younger generations to appreciate and enjoy. In February of 1997, the State Historical Fund granted $75,000 to the Vogel Canyon Conservation Project to be administered by the Pikes Peak Chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society. The necessary pieces for a successful project were beginning to come together. Additional contributions were made by Otero County, the Tempest Grazing Association, and the La Junta High School class of 1969, which collected monies from its members and worked to clean up the canyon. Vogel Canyon began its climb to a new era of prominence. Rock art conservator Claire Dean came to the canyon in the early 90s and began the slow process of identifying ways to remove the various types of graffiti that marred the canyon's walls. Claire developed a series of new techniques to remove spray-painted graffiti without damaging the irreplaceable rock imagery underneath. Petroglyphs are pictures formed by carving or pecking out a figure into the stone whereas pictographs are drawings that are painted on a stone surface. There were more than 50 graffiti locations, the largest measured three feet by eight feet. This year, 97, has culminated finally in us being able to really tackle the graffiti in a major way instead of doing it piecemeal, which is we've had to do in the past as funds become available. We have two methods that you can use to um, tackle this problem. One of them is chemical-based, and it involves using chemical materials that are uh, pretty much the same as a commercial paint stripper that you would buy over the counter in a hardware store. However, as conservators, we tend to mix our own so that we can get exactly the chemical combination that we uh, want and that we think is going to be the most effective. And we had really quite mixed uh, success with that, and that's because of the geology here in Bogle Canyon with the sandstone. It produces uh, a mineral deposit on the surface very rapidly, which effectively seals in the sp spray paint and fixes it onto the rock. When chemical paint removing methods don't work, we have to resort to using mechanical systems for removal. The method that I've been using here is something called an air abrasive system, which is similar in many ways to sandblasting in that it uses compressed air to deliver an abrasive powder. However, the pressure that is used is much, much lower than in a commercial unit. Uh, we're talking of a maximum of around 40 pounds per square inch pressure for, for the airflow. 
Um, and the abrasive powder that's used is extremely fine and much softer than a commercial grit. Uh, the powder itself is somewhere around 34, 35 micron, which um, is something similar to powdered sugar. So it feels like coarse powdered sugar rather than sand. Because it's delivered at a lower pressure and the grit itself is very fine and is softer than uh, commercial sand grit, it is more gentle on the surface and more controllable, so we have a better chance of rem only removing the paint and not damaging surfaces underneath. We have some examples here of very deeply carved or incised graffiti um, on a number of the sites. The question, of course, is what do we do with these? The fill material that Claire had created for other rock art sites could not work here. There was not enough rock surface for it to cling on to. The fill would be subjected to hot and cold temperatures, weathering the color of the fill so that it would no longer match the color of the rock. Luckily, vegetation shielded the graffiti from view. Claire faced other challenges. Scratch graffiti, petroglyphs that had been outlined in chalk, gunshot damage, bullet holes. This is one of the most extreme here. Um, you can see how deep this is. This is the surface out here, and my fingers are weighed back in there, so that's probably a couple of inches in depth. Unfortunately, nothing can be done to repair this. The same is true of the chalk outlines that some people use to enhance petroglyphs. The chalk doesn't wash off. It tends to cling to the stone and with time becomes mineralized and won't brush off. Um, that chalk that you can see around the elt there is extremely hard and it's in effect become part of the rock. Chalking is also considered vandalism and is prosecutable by law. For scratch graffiti, Claire mixed and matched paints with the color of the rock, then applied it. The idea isn't to cover it completely, but to break it up so that visually it's not so obvious unless you're really on top of it. Claire continued the very slow and painstaking process of removing graffiti from the 50 or so locations, often working on an inch at a time, and often working alone from dawn until dusk during the summer and fall of 1997. After almost 10 years from the first day that she stepped into the canyon and saw the destruction there, Claire Dean completed her mission in September of 1997. The next step, modifying the existing hiking trails to further protect the canyon walls. Many volunteers, along with the Forest Service personnel, gave hours and hours of their time over several months to build and reroute hiking trails into the canyon. Participants from the Colorado Boys Ranch marked them clearly with rock cairns. Later, members of the Pikes Peak chapter of the Colorado Archaeological Society and members of the Forest Service Passport and Time program added even more muscle power as they shoveled, dug, and moved rock to relocate the trail for maximum protection of the canyon walls and its fragile rock art. And so what we're here today to celebrate is, is the successful partnerships that preserve this, this unique heritage. Um, really, without the, without the hard work, dedication of all the folks here, as well as many, many others, uh, a really important record of the past would have been lost. This project uh, has involved a lot of different partners and it's the kind of thing that though the Forest Service might like to do this sort of a project on our own, uh, it's really too complicated and has too many facets uh, for us to accomplish by ourselves. We would not have been able to do this without the partnership that has built up between the Colorado Archaeological Society, the Pikes Peak chapter, and the state of Colorado. And without their assistance, this project couldn't have happened. Though we're the managers here, uh, 
the, the effort, the dedication, the enthusiasm of our partners has really made this possible. Thank you everyone so much for all your hard work. Guys ready? Good. So should we go take a look at it? <laughs> the most important thing that we learned was that um, we can work together, that the public and the uh, private sectors can work together for a goal and to achieve something like what we've achieved down in the canyon is just amazing. And I think that this is probably um, the way of the future. The whole community of La Junta, Colorado has taken um, this project in this canyon as their own and I've seen you know, a lot more community support. Even if I come down here on the weekend, I'll see people from the community down here just walking around and look at the rock art. And you always hear the comments about how nice it is and how everything's looking. And I can take a lot of pride in that. Look, uh, yeah, look at the smiley part and then let your eyes follow around to the top oh. and see how it's actually a circle. Oh, yeah. You see that? See it right there. Yeah. And you see how there's lines through the center of the, the center of the circle? At the bottom, yeah. go down. At the That's a shield the figure. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. see, like the kind of a big a shield that a, a warrior might hide behind? Uh, look, see. Mm -hmm. What do you think the circles are? Those big circle things. Chris? They're, they were probably sandblasted. Mrs. Russell? Somebody stood over on the other side of that draw over there on, the other, um, on those rocks with a high-powered rifle and shot at this. What do you bet? What, what does it do to the petroglyphs, Brandon? It, it messes it up. It ruins it. It, takes it, away, ruins it. it takes away the meaning. Yeah, it does take away meaning. It takes away a lot of their meaning. We want to make future generations preservationists so we won't have vandalism like this in years to come. They will just naturally understand the importance of preserving resources. Apparently, these children understood the message as they voluntarily picked up broken glass in the canyon. Children are the key to this. Our younger generations do not seem to be quite so ignorant about their history, and they seem to have a higher level of awareness of both their natural and cultural environment. We feel that at Vogel Canyon there has been a wonderful change from local apathy to local stewardship where young children travel to the canyon today in the company of their school teachers. Children today now obviously care for it and recognize that it is something that they share a mutual responsibility for. What makes the, the Vogel Canyon project special to me is really what makes the grasslands special to me. And that is that most of the recreational opportunities available on the grasslands involve heritage sites. And they involve prehistoric and historic archaeological sites. People come to the grasslands to learn about history. It's an important part of, of their visit here. From prehistoric rock art to remains of the Santa Fe Trail, one thing that I think is special about uh, Forest Service lands and, and one really fantastic opportunity we have is to provide people with, with an authentic experience of the past. Uh, as part of the TV culture, we're bombarded by images of Native Americans, images of the Wild West, images of westward expansion, and these are really in many ways stereotypes. And here, on National Forest System lands in Vogel Canyon, we have the real thing. That real thing was preserved through hard work, cooperation between public and private partners, and the financial backing of many individuals and organizations. Vandalism has now been significantly reduced. Educational programs are in place to teach people about the importance of the canyon's archeological and historical resources. An interpretive program including signs along the trails is complete. Visitors can read about and explore the stories of this unusual place. A place that contains hundreds of years of lifestyles and cultures from prehistoric to historic peoples, all recorded on the canyon's walls. A renewed face gives Vogel Canyon a renewed spirit.